Magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. Welcome to our virtual reading, mga tula para sa mong kagawa in honor of the month of Overseas Filipinos and International Migrants Day. I'm your host, Eileen Casanero, Poet Laureate of San Mateo County in California. And with me today um, are some very um, distinguished guests, Consul General Henry, Henry Bensurto and Poets Romalin Ante, Troy Cabida, Eugene Gloria, Danibel Gutierrez, and Dr. Luisa Gloria. Um, every December, we celebrate the many contributions of overseas Filipinos. There are over 12 million of us scattered in over 100 countries and wherever we are in the world, our community has always been about cooperation, compassion and caring. One group in particular has been on the front lines of this current pandemic. There are about 150,000 Filipino nurses in the US alone. And in California, Filipinos make up almost 20% of the nursing workforce. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our nurses and frontliners for their service and sacrifices. And I would like to especially dedicate today's event to them. Um, and are we ready for, uh, or will um, Deputy Conjen Solano be um, giving the welcome remarks or the um, opening remarks? Consular waiting for Consul General um, Binsurto. Um, so, um, um, uh, Deputy Conjen Solano, would you like to tell us more about um, forthcoming events of the consulate? I'm sorry. Um, would you would you like to share some forthcoming events? I know you have Simbangabe and a lot of um, you have the weekly show Tanong ni Konjen. Well, thank you, Eileen, and uh, good to see you all and meet you all, even virtually. Um, thank you also for this opportunity to address uh, this uh, distinguished group. I understand that we have uh, with us uh, the distinguished po poet laureates from all over including the Middle East. I was assigned previously the Middle East. So I know the situation of our overseas uh, migrant workers there. And I thank you all, uh, I mean, the organizers for um, bringing us together in this event to give tribute to our migrant uh, Filipino workers. As to the events of uh, the consulate, we just had this uh, Paskuhan sa Consulado. I don't know if uh, you've uh, um, watched the PFC episode was uh, shown last uh, Saturday at 3.15, so we had this Paskuhan sa Consular. And that's going to be um, replayed in our Facebook page on December 24, so I hope that you have the time to watch the event. We also have this TNC, so TFC, we're in, um, well, actually it's uh, an online discussion forum where we discuss all these uh, issues that are important to our overseas uh, Filipinos, particularly here in uh, our areas of uh, jurisdiction in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. And uh, we, the, the question actually asks, and on behalf of the community, the questions that are foremost in the minds of our uh, kababayans. And then we ask uh, Philippine government officials, including the consulate officials, to answer these questions. So on consular matters, on the situation of the COVID, as well as um, the quarantine, um, procedures that are in place in the Philippines. So we ask those, uh, the country asks those questions and we answer. So it's like a, an information dissemination um, um, tool or mechanism wherein we convey this important or critical information to our community. And we also have this TNC or TFC. It's a six minute uh, video snippets that uh, are shown to our Kababayans via the PFC. I hope you'll have the time to watch uh, those uh, video snippets. So I mean, I won't take much of the time. Um, and thank you for this opportunity to address the group. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deputy Consul General Raquel Solano. Without further ado, it is my honor and great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Henry S. Bensurta Jr. Consul General of the Philippines in San Francisco, as well as recipient of the Presidential Award from former Philippine Presidents Benigno Aquino and Gloria Macapagal. 
He is also the 2016 Torchbearer Awardee of the Philippine American Press Club USA and the 2017 Most Distinguished Alumnus Awardee of the University of the Philippines. Consul General Binsurto, for those who are not aware, is also the Dean of the San Francisco Consular Corps, whose members include all 74 heads of mission in Northern California. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Conjun Binsurto. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eileen. Uh, uh, thank you for for the invitation and thank you all for coming together. Thank you also, uh, Deputy Consul General uh, Raquel Solano for that information. I also have with me my other consul, Jed Leona, uh, who's in charge of the political and economic diplomacy. So thank you for 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 this uh, and the opportunity to engage. And I, I just heard the Deputy Consul General apprise you of the various programs of the consulate to give those information out into the public. I'm particularly grateful that you have this gathering to sort of recognize and acknowledge the value of overseas Filipinos. And I think uh, uh, the uh, overseas Filipinos, especially the contract workers, they're very close to the heart uh, of the government. Uh, this is this is especially very close and personal to me because uh, my first job and as soon as I joined government, particularly the the legal office of the Department of Foreign Affairs, my first case was the floor contemplation, uh, and uh, I know that from every corners because I was. Uh, I was the workhorse on that as a junior officer. So I know what the ins and outs and the complete story of that from zero to, to finish. And so uh, that, that incident was very critical, historically speaking, uh, because it triggered the reorientation of the overall, overall policy of government, not just on the foreign policy aspect of things, but overall as a national policy. By now you must have uh, notice that in every speech of the secretary, you would always mention the three pillars uh, of our foreign policy, which is economic diplomacy, national security, and also assistance to nationals. And that pillar of our foreign policy, you can trace it back to this particular case because it opened the consciousness of the entire government I would say not just the entire government, but the conscious of, conscience of the entire country, not just of the Philippines as a country, but also Singapore. And to that extent, therefore, we have become a, a trailblazer, a forerunner, a leader in terms of protection of overseas uh, uh, workers. Uh, uh, we have also passed a law, uh, a national law, uh, protecting migrant workers. And so for every foreign service officer who is assigned abroad, uh, this is an indelible important mission that we all have from the, uh, from the staff all the way to the ambassador or all the way to the consul general. This is first and foremost uh, in our mission as we go abroad. Uh, and, and so it is a matter of law. It's also a crime under our, our, our law now. Uh, no other country has this law that criminalizes or makes it a crime not uh, to be negligent uh, of his function in providing that assistance to a Filipino, uh, a distressed national abroad. It's also a crime that if there is a fault that uh, that, that, that is uh, of the standard of a criminal fault, uh, a felony, then it's also a, a crime. Uh, passport, uh, uh, human trafficking uh, essentially is part of this web. Uh, you see, it's not just a matter of us uh, including it in our foreign policy, but it is really an, a web of protection that you can find in various as various legislations. The human trafficking, uh, where we have uh, engaged in close cooperation with the United States to make sure uh, that we're able to run after, prevent, and prosecute. But at the same time, we don't only stop in the prosecution of human traffickers, but we also have a program with USAID in terms of rehabilitating victims of human trafficking. Uh, in terms of our 
foreign policy, we are always at the front in terms of pushing for conventions that will afford universal protection to all migrant workers. Oh, uh, obviously, we have the overseas Filipinos, but we have to put this in a universal context because it is not only the Philippines that uh, has overseas nationals. We can speak of, uh, we can talk about Indonesia, uh, we can talk. We, we can also talk of Pakistan, uh, India. So these countries, and and I think at the end of the day, at the center of all these legislations and policies, we have to always remember that that the topic, the core uh, of what we are speaking about, are real human beings. You real human beings, who may be driven by some reasons, economic or otherwise, seek to have a better life. Uh, not only for themselves, but for their families and their and the future generations of their of their descendants. I think this is at the very core, and uh, we're one of the few countries, but I can say we're the first country that has put this in legislation. And to this day, to this day, we have been a leader, uh, uh, both in terms of the United Nations uh, and even private international law in creating this web of protection for our nationals. Uh, so I think um, I, cannot, uh, I cannot emphasize it further uh, that in the context of the, of the consulate here as well, uh, because the, the, the concept of assistance to nationals, which is very, very common in Middle East because of, because of the uh, cultural milieu where uh, of the setting, uh, you know, in, in the Middle East, it's very unfortunate, but col culturally, uh, slaves are, are, are still a concept uh, culturally, and it will take a generation to change this. But we have taken steps to tell our counterparts in that part of the world uh, about the concept of slavery, that these people who work there are not slaves, that they are human, uh, and that uh, as, as human as their Arab employers, for example, and, and therefore that un universal human rights is applicable as it is applicable to the, to, the, to the employers. And this has been the mandate, this has been the mo motivation, this has been the driving force for our engagement in the Middle East. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the concept of assistance to nationals there uh, is to the extent of really saving lives, uh, uh, having equality uh, with the rest of the population there. In the context of the United States, it's a different concept because here uh, it, 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 it has evolved into something else and that is community engagement essentially because here you don't have those slaves. Obviously you still have human trafficking, you have the masterminds who are based here and uses the internet to a large degree in, in doing that. And so we have engagement with the Department of Justice and also the NGOs. But, but the large part of that, however, uh, is very different from the assistance that we do in, in terms of the Middle East. As I mentioned here, it's more of a community engagement. Uh, community engagement here, it's really more of empowering the community. It's really about uh, uh, giving the community a profile that it deserves uh, for it to have a voice. Because here, in in the context of your of your cultural setting here, uh, um, uh, um, it's 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 a different milieu uh, altogether in the Middle East. So here, it's about empowering you as individuals, having that recognition and the voice, uh, so that your community, in terms of allocation of resources, uh, would uh, would have that ability to uh, to get those resources that are appropriate for your community, and that will will only come in when you have a community. Who is, who is cognizant, cognizant of your uniqueness, uh, who is not embarrassed by the color of your skin, who is not embarrassed uh, by the shape of your nose, but somebody who will, uh, who acknowledges uh, who he is, where he come from, how he has evolved, and hopefully that would translate into confidence, confidence with the ability to speak for the community, 
to be of help to the community, to be part of that community, diverse as you are, because we're not talking about uniformity here, but you can still achieve unity despite the diversity. And we've seen that happen, and it's something that we encourage here. And so at the end of the day, the end goal really is about empowerment, empowerment of each and every Filipino lineage, regardless of whether you hold a Philippine passport or not, uh, for as long as you have that blood, uh, no matter what the percentage is, for as long as you connect your lineage to that ancestor of yours, and that historical recognition, that historical consciousness hopefully would translate in you understanding yourself more and translating that into you being empowered and when an individual constituents of your community are empowered then the community itself will benefit from this as an empowered community and so the consulate is very much attuned and this is the this is really the goal and the direction of what we have started here Five, uh, more than five years ago in terms of the Spark Connect Empower. And this is the reason why that seemingly insignificant battle cry, Pinoy ako, Pinay ako, taas no, Pinoy ako, proud ako, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it, it's seemingly significant, but when you go deep into that, that's what this is all about. And the reason why we're repeating this is because repetition hopefully will immerse the person into that consciousness of his being and we're talking of that being, and that being includes that Filipino heritage. And so this is the end goal, and this is going to take generations, but we have to start from somewhere. And this is the start, and this is where we should all work together and partner together uh, for the common good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Consul General Bensurto, to you and your staff for the work that you do for our community and for um, members of the international community in Northern California. Mabuhay kayim lahat. Buhay. Friends, the Philippine Consulate General is inviting everyone to watch the Nong Nikon Gen on Wednesday, December 16 at 10 a.m. The topic is about helping Filipino consumers and micro entrepreneurs get access to credit in the Philippines. Please go to the Consulate's Facebook page, PHNSF, for more information. Um, now we move on to our poetry reading. Our first reader is not only a notable poet in the UK, she is also a member of the Filipino nursing workforce. I am delighted to introduce Roma Ante, a Wolverhampton-based award-winning poet and editor. Her debut collection is Anti-Emetic for Homesickness, the first East Asian to win the Poetry London Prize and the Manchester Poetry Prize. She has been featured in South Bank Center, Book Week, Scotland, Harper's Bazaar, Vogue UK, Birmingham Literature Festival, and Verb Poetry Festival. Apart from being a writer, Romalin also works full-time as a specialist nurse practitioner. Please welcome Romalin Ante. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you. Um, thanks for that, for that very wonderful introduction. And thank you as well, Mr. Ben Sorto. I thought that your speech right there really hit the chord for me. Um, as someone who came to the UK as the daughter of a migrant nurse and as a nurse myself at the moment. Um, I'm going to read three poems. The first poem that I'm going to read is from Anti-Emetic for Homesickness, which is recently published with Chatter in Windows. The title is called Names and this poem is my attempt to explore what it means to be exiled. Exiled not only through employment, but also exiled emotionally, distanced from your family. But it's, it is also my attempt to explore what it means to find a sense of belonging in the names that are given to us. Names. We are nameless and all names are ours. Emmanuel Lacaba. My mother's name is Rosanna, but when she left, I had other mothers, Rowena, Jimboy, Alma. I was named after the first syllables of my parents. I will always have them with me. My mother says not all names have meaning. Riverside, Manila, London, Corba. And someday I will forget all the commands I did not heed 
like the time I did not spin the plate clockwise before my father left for work, even if it would deliver him from accidents. Not all destinations are found in the junctions of your palm lines. Say better life, say better life, and God knows I am repenting. Say Airbus something, say one way ticket, keep following the sunset. Clouds are the closest things to my mother. Say United Kingdom, say the Queen, NHS. Does winter always mean? Listen, can you hear it? The loneliness of stretchers along A and E corridors. And the strongest part of me is the scar I hide underneath my fringe. My mother hides in the staff toilet to make long distance calls. Someday I will realize the woman lonely in her mansion is not my mother, but a future version of myself. I will chop beer guards on the galaxy gleamer of her worktop. Shall we shorten your name on your name tag so it's easier to remember? Say, yes, please, sister. Say, Arnold, Marcus, Harold. Say, septicemia, alcohol poisoning, hernia. Say, Jason, Darius, Vernon. Say, cancer, myocardial infarction, query, it's schizophrenia. Hides in the toilet. And I have the first syllables of my parents' names. That is why I am not scared. A boy sticks out his tongue and says, I do not have a mother. I punch him in the face, the sanctity of blood. I am not scared because my mother has followed the sunset because she has burnt her lips on mash and gravy in a three minute lunch break because she calls me Anak, my child, my baby. She asks, what do you want for Christmas, for your birthday? 1990 remains stuck on the other line. Say, please, sister, can I take this call? My brass blossom, she can call me only by my name. I have the first syllables of my parents' names. That is why I am not scared. I can track the mountain of Makulot, my father's rifle hanging from my back. I can carry myself, not how someone carries a cytotoxic drug, but how my mother hooks with her finger, a drained bottle with blood clots, the weight of gemstones. So overseas Filipino workers like my mother and like many of my colleagues spend a fraction of their monthly wage on little gifts. And they buy little gifts and put it inside a balik buying box. Once full, as you know, we send a balik buying box to the Philippines to remind our loved ones that even though we're far away, um, we still think of them. So the next poem that I'm going to read is called Notes Inside a Balik Buying Box. Nowadays, a lot of Filipinos still leave our homeland. 5,000 Filipinos leave every day and I remember as a child uh, as a left behind child I used to wait for the balik buying boxes from my mother and I remember my brother specifically being so excited opening this balik buying boxes full of gifts so I guess this poem is my attempt to explore what it means to have material things as replacement for your parents and also what is what it means to have something passed down to you through material things or through language, language that is said and language that remains unuttered. Notes inside a balik bind box. Dear son, in my place, here is a balik bind box. Here are the Lebron James rubber shoes, size nine, and the video game tapes to replace all the pump cakes I owe you for every Simbangabi and PTA meeting I could not attend. I promise I'll be there for Christmas. I know I've been saying this for a decade now. 
Find the E45 cream for your grandma's tissue dry skin, a stack of incontinence pads and tubes of barrier balm. Between you and me, every time I roll old people onto their sides and lift their knees to their chest for suppositories, I ask myself, who does this for her? Tell Tita to leave her husband, her school sweetheart, whose mistresses are Majong and Sabong. Tell her not to bear the stink of his armpits. In the box, find the Gucci Bloom perfume and scar creams. Tell her, I haven't forgotten our vows when we were young and our fingers smelled of lihing we candies. Our walang iwan an oath to never leave each other. Dear son, in my place, here is a balik buy box. Rip all the packaging tape. Every gift inside is yours. Work your hands hard until there's nothing left. Learn that to survive, we must have strong arms. To carry a tray full of medicine and not let one drop. To push a hyperventilating woman with speed and care to the maternity wing. To lift and sit a skin and bone man down on his chemo chair. To gauge the weight of a rose before you lay it onto a coffin. Take this box inside our house. That is all I ask you to carry for now, my son. <clears throat> there's, um, there's a quote that says, it is a truth universally acknowledged, blah, 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 blah. But I think as a Filipino nurse, my quote goes something like, it is a truth universally acknowledged that all Filipinos must be nurses. Especially if you came from a very underprivileged background and all you want is economic security, you would have dreams, but sometimes you would just go towards the nursing path to make sure that your job is stable and secured. But then, actually, that's untruth because not all Filipinos are nurses. We also have nannies across um, the world, as Mr. Ben Surto said. Um, Flor Contemplacion, that was the case that my family really um, watched. And I really remembered it growing up as a child in the Philippines. And I was quite scared every time my mom would go abroad because it's not just about a mother um, being away from you. It's not just about having actual transnational families existing in the world, but it's also about what it is. What is the human cost of migration? And of course, we also have seamen all over the world. When I say seamen, seafarers. My brother is, <laughs> my brother is a seaman and he's just... He's just gone back to the Philippines for Christmas holiday, and then in January, he will go back again um, in a ship, and he will go all over the world again. So the last poem that I'm going to read is called Group Portrait at the Stopover. And I wrote this poem back in 2017 when I went to the Philippines for a holiday, and I was at Dubai airport, and I saw all the Filipinos going in that last plane to, um, to the Philippines. So I was in a connecting flight. And um, growing up, I had stories from my mother about her adventures abroad, all the Filipinos that she was meeting, how they would meet each other in different countries and also at airports and share to one another the food of the countries they came from. And back in 2017, I was really shocked. I was filled with both joy and sadness. Joy because I know that after so many years, Filipinos is still choose to sacrifice, is still choose to leave in order to rebuild the lives that their families deserve. But also sad because I know that after so many years, sadly, there are still countries like the Philippines, third world country, and also so many countries in the world that cannot provide security to their people. And so the families exist throughout the world and transnational families continue to exist. Again, thank you so much, Eileen, and thank you everyone for listening.
group portrait at the stopover. Take a walk over the sharp stones, then come back. Pablo Neruda. One. Elbow to elbow on waiting chairs, we rummage through our luggage for treasures and out flitter sunbirds. I lift the 24 karat radiance of butter fudge. Take this, Sigina, and I will accept your focaccia and basbuza. Two. Manong, tell me your story until the whole terminal smells of petrol and rust. Salt-soaked tanker, the skyscraper tide that almost sank your ship is now the wind beating the viewing glass. Remember the afternoons that could burn a dragonfly, the oil stickiness of your wife's lips, and the baby you left one night, who by the morning of your return had turned into a man with a beard. Three. Manang, you keep glancing at me. For a moment, I thought the burn mark on your cheek was a spotted moth wing. I am listening. Whisper of the days you must dab garlic on your wrist. Smear grease on your neck so sir won't grab. Speak of the years you spent sleeping on floors, beside potatoes and pickle jars, and the day you learned how to arrange flowers for visitors, fill the vases with faithful water, admire the petals whose edges are like so teeth. Four. Manong, Manang, take this. And I will tell you how I pull out with five colleagues, a bariatric man from the driver's seat and start chest compressions in the hospital car park. I will take you there between rushing to a and &E and the doctor yelling, jump on him. Jump there with me on top of the stretcher, the man between your legs, your hands pumping his heart. Do not fear the clatter of wheels, the bumps and slopes in corridors. It is only turbulence. Five, let these duty-free bags distract our loved ones from the scars on our feet. Tarana, let's not think for now of the next generation that will meet at this gate. The same old stories that will hum out of younger mouths. Let's go home to our elders' kitchens where tapioca pearls soften in the choir of casseroles. Thank you. That was gorgeous. Thank you so much, Roma. Um, can you, I, I'm just so proud at how you have taken the UK by storm. Um, can you tell us more about your forthcoming events? Yes, sure. Um, not much now <laughs> for the rest of the year, but um, in 2021, I'll be reading with Car Caroline Forche at Kendall Poetry Festival. And hopefully I would have another event, which is US based, but I will let you know as soon as it's confirmed. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Eileen. you, Roma. Friends, Romaline's book is available from booksarmagic.net. Um, our next reader is Troy Kabida, pronouns he, him, a poet and producer based in Southwest London, a former member of the Barbican Young Poets and Roundhouse Poetry Collective. Troy is currently a producer for London Open Mic Night, Poetry and Shaw, and co-founder of Luaiwai Colectivo, an arts and culture network providing space for UK-based Filipino AX creatives. His debut pamphlet, War Dove, was published by Bad Betty Press in 2020. Please welcome Troy Kabida. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Magandang gabi. Um, good morning to everyone, um, wherever you are in the world. <laughs> My name is Troy Kabida. I'm a poet. I'm a producer. I'm a university student. I just came home from, um, well, I came from online class. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's really, it's an honor to be here. So thank you, Eileen, for having me. Um, like, like Roma, like Ate Roma, I'm also from the UK. Um, yeah, and I've, I've moved, I moved here in, in 2007 with my parents. 
I mean, I've lived here since then. And um, actually this year is interesting because this year's anniversary of us being in the country marks, I think I've been in the, I've been in the UK more than I have been in the Philippines. And it's quite an interesting feeling, but um, poems. Um, I'm gonna read two new poems that I've, I've successfully managed to write this year. And then I'm gonna move on to my pamphlet of poems. Um, this first poem is written after a very fond memory that I have of me and my friend, my classmate back in secondary school or high school. Um, it's called, Ayan Bunk's History and Sits Next to Me in Art. Bunking means when you skip class, by the way. I'm not sure if you know. It's important to note that throughout this story, Miss Dix didn't realize she had an extra student. In a few years, we will wonder if she was racist for not being able to tell apart her non-white students. We will wonder if all of our teachers then were racist. In this specific lesson, Ayan comes in and cannot stop feeling confused. She looks at the whiteboard, notices the stains of paint shaped like fingerprints on the edges of the board, colored water never cleaned off. She, gla she glances at my work, a sketching exercise of a Matisse impression. Her eyes widen and ask, is this it? You just sit here and draw for your A star, copying a dead white man's definition of art while I have to learn about other dead white men and their definition of peace. Thank you. So I wrote that and my friend was not happy. She was like, I can't believe you wrote a poem about me. <laughs> but you know, I like it. <laughs> um, this next poem I also wrote this year. Um, so in central London, in the main part of the city, there's a bookshop called Gaze of the Word, which stocks a lot of literature written by LGBTQIA writers. Um, it was my first time there this summer and um, the feeling was, was very good. It was very interesting because um, I've never been in a space like that before. As someone who identifies as queer, it was, a, it was a warm feeling. So the title is On My First Visit to Gaze the Word. I thought of my parents the entire time. Not them now, of course. They're all forgiven after having asked for forgiveness. No, it's their younger, sharper versions that stick to my brain like first instinct when I'm in new surroundings. How they taught me to always doubt and be aware of how physical I am, of the possibility that I may be standing on a spot someone else should be. I'm staring at a bookshelf but I'm actually distracted by the thought of how my parents would react if they knew that the son they once defined as broken and tried to piece it back together using comic books and threads of my ankle tied to a tree branch is currently browsing in a bookshop full of stories about boys liking boys and nothing was niche about it. Nothing was blasphemous. Here, protest is not a disruption to peace, but synonymous to celebration. Here, a Filipino boy enjoying his brownness is recorded in a photography book. The text talks of how being a Scorpio has affected his Tinder relationships. He calls it multitasking. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> cool. So those are two of the poems I managed to write this year. Um, but also this year, um, May of 2020, I'm um, this indie press, independent press called Bad Betty Press, um, founded by Jake Wildhall and Amy Aker, published my debut pamphlet called War Dove. <laughs> and um, they, thank you. Um, there's a really great poet in the UK called Rachel Long, and uh, her collection also came out this year. And she said that one of the biggest advantages of having a book is you don't have to print poems anymore or look at your phone, which is great. <laughs> it's very true. I get to just sort of have it here and carry it whenever. Um, Word of is a special pamphlet for me, not just because it's my first ever pamphlet. Um, it talks about the first year of my life after coming out of the closet as queer. And um, a lot of people tell me that, you know, coming out of the closet is the hardest part. And I'm like, not really, it's what happens afterwards. Because you ha there's a lot of things you can't control. And I really hate that in terms of like your relationships, how people treat you, how you treat yourself initially. Um, and reading back to this pamphlet, I'm 
really grateful to have to have gone through it and to sort of worked through it and have written poems about it as well. <laughs> so this poem I'm going to read is called Lad Lad, which incidentally actually came out um, previously in this journal called Harana, which at Roma Linante is actually one of the editors of. And um, so I thank her because she edited it she edited the poem a lot and um yeah thank you Ataroma. <laughs> lad lad from tagalog unfolded spreading out on a surface to expose and the nearest translation you're given is sharp translates to you stretching out of yourself your wrists bending at the sides of a box struggling to contain you translates to you falling from somewhere high, reminder that you are unpolished quartz. Your sense of man cracked for wanting man, as if to say, you deserve all that is twisting your heart, all that is crushing your torso. Thank you. So that was Lad Lad. Um, the, the poem was much longer, by the way. And then Atarombalin got a hold of it. She was like, no, we're going to go through this. <laughs> and it was all a labor of love. And um, really thankful for that. <laughs> uh, this next poem uh, is called Examples of Confusion. One, to the friends waiting on another day of happy, of maintaining that happy, eating out with that happy, let that happy mimic the winter sun. Scorch down on you until you're numb. Capital H, like a yellow ladder balancing itself. You can laugh through floods and earthquakes and dictators, but your heart cracks easy for emotions. You're losing color. Two. I was in Acosta one Sunday morning editing a friend's essay on depression when blankly she says, people like us don't go through like things like this, do we? Somewhere in Manila, a morning school bus leaves a housewife behind, her husband on the last tricycle to work. She tends the last night's beer bottle shard lingering outside the front terrace, sweeps them underneath a graying rug. Three. The camera is practically making out with Timothy Chalamet's face, enjoying every inch of teary cheek, romancing yet another scrunched up white boy forehead. His words ooze out like of his pores, thick like lava. I swear I can taste him speak. Thank you. Cool. I'll read one last poem. Thank you very much. Um, so this poem is the, the end of the pamphlet. And um, the form of it is very interesting because the title is called Not Dying for London. And um, it's after a form called The Ogden written by a very close friend of mine who was also a poet named Sugar J. Poet. Jeremiah Brown. And what happens is, I'm not sure if you can see. So the title is four words. Mm -hmm. And then each stanza starts with one word of the poem, or the title. And then the poem's sort of purpose is to squeeze out images and stories of each word. Um, and it's a really fun form because um, I just get, keep going and going and going and going. <laughs> and I wrote this poem one time in, in 2017 um, during April when it was meant to be springtime but it was still snowing and um no one liked it because the, the sheep the sheep couldn't give birth because it was too cold it's really sad <laughs> so yeah thank you again to eileen for having us not dying for london not as in denial as in resistance as a physical form of denial as in growing older as in growing in the right tempo as in tightness around my stomach, as in exhales that do nothing, as in this isn't what should be defined as healing, dying, as in Sunday evenings talking to a bridge, as in rejecting a hug, as in a sleeping drunk, as in your back as a symphony of cracks, as in the path I chose, as in a side effect of truth, as in a side effect of silence, as in not speaking. Four, as in empathy, as in the lesser sibling of compassion, as in service for others, as in the service to the self, as in going through with it, as in deflecting bullets, as in by refusing my embrace, whose heart are you really protecting? London, 
I see a white woman's shoulder bumping into me. I see a strong pace to deflect white woman's shoulder bumping into me. As in everyday delay, as in everyday diverted, as in blind when rainy, but blinding when sunny, as in weather trying to kill me, as in a city trying to kill me, as in a city trying to toughen me up, as in a city trying to kill me, as in a city failing. Thank you very much. Karami <laughs> Salamat. Thank you, Troy. That was beautiful. Um, do you have any upcoming events? Um, I not right now, but I am making a few. But actually, uh, my my collect my Kuliwaiwai Collectivo, uh, we're producing. Um, so earlier this month, we hosted our first of online fundraiser called Art for APH, and we're collaborating with a um, a charity in in Cagayan Valley, Philippines called Lasamlo Relief. Um, we had hosted our first fundraiser, which went fantastically well. And my partner, uh, her name is Jessica Nicole Manuel. She is holding the next project, which is a lot of visual artists. She's co co um, combining a lot of visual artists uh, to sell their work in uh, also part of the fundraiser. So I will post more information about that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, friends, choice pamphlet or chapbook is available from badbettypress.com. Our next reader is none other than the award-winning author of four collections, all published by Penguin Books. Eugene Gloria was selected for the National Poetry Series and the Asian American Literary Award, among other awards. He is the John Rabb Emerson Professor of Creative and Performing Arts and Professor of English at DePauw University. His most uh, recent book is Sightseer in This Killing City, published by Penguin Random House in 2019. Welcome, Eugene Gloria. Thank you, Eileen. Thanks, everyone, for uh, making this happen uh, this uh, afternoon here in the Midwest. I don't know what time it is over in the Middle East or what, what time it is in, 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 in the UK, but I can imagine um, a much more interesting time zone than where we are right here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to start reading some poems. Um, I'll start with um, Here on Earth, and this is, uh, it, this is from my collection, um, My Favorite Warlord. And uh, it takes place in a restaurant in Indianapolis. Here on Earth, imagine the pleasure inside the storm the foam rush from rain gutters. Imagine yourself here inside a restaurant on an unlit street. Say it is a bad neighborhood, even after the rain. Take the immigrant face of our waiter who is also the proprietor. Say, Peter, it's been weeks. We've come to eat. We've been hankering for your fa. We know what we want, the same meal we always order. Me, the number one appetizer. My wife, the number three. From our entrees, the number 38 and the number 30. The booths here are lit by bright faces. Vietnamese, Thai, Chinese, and Filipino. Hundreds of years on their faces. School teachers, witnesses of terror, readers of Chekhov, office clerks, with inner lives. Then the bottle blonde salary man in a dress shirt with silver cufflinks moseys in to pick up his takeout order. He is tall and pockmarked like my father. He could almost be my father, except for the dyed blonde hair. Over the number one and the number three appetizers, we are speculating, my wife and I, where the salary man comes from, Manila or Saigon. Oh, but here comes Peter with our orders of steaming bowls of pho, our faces shining like Klieg lights. Inside this booth, my moon face is a lantern in the mainstream, lengthening, lengthening. Here on earth, we are curtained by rain a subset in the far corners floating toward the center. We are an island in landlocked America. We are Thai, Filipino, and Vietnamese. We are, all of us, post-exotics. Uh, 
Um, I'll read another poem. This poem is uh, from my second collection, uh, Hoodlum Birds. And um, this was, this is one of the first poem in the collection. The poem takes largely, takes place largely in, um, in Spain uh, years ago when I was traveling to Europe for the first time. This is called The Law, Avila, 1982. When the civil guards approached me and asked me for my papers, I pictured the face of a sunny saint being disemboweled on the rack. Widows in perennial black attics of prayer find comfort here the way monks in hair shirts must take to penance or me addled in my blissed out days in San Francisco, tugging daily on a roach. And that's how I must have been befogged in Avila on a visit that coincided with a papal tour. A murder of crows, clerics, nuns, and wimples tarring the field with their black habits. St. Francis de Sales dispenses the measure of love is to love without measure. This republic of goodness was once peopled with spies. Maybe that's what got the saints in trouble. Their willingness to surrender once found out. I know authority when I see it make a U-turn to pull me over. I also know that the Burgos Christ in pageant red skirt is tethered to a story its wheels and welts, blue-black, the wounds Nicodemus witnessed as he lowered Jesus alone in his discarded body. The carving by Nicodemus would one day float its way, first to a monastery, then to Burgos. When the civil guards approached me and asked me for my papers, I felt for a string around my neck, my scapular, like a leaf pressed on the road of pistols and stamens. That moment stood for something I can no longer recall. What with those men and their gift of whiteness, their constant need of proof. I must have smiled at them, clueless yet longing to be profound. I'll read another poem from this collection. This is from Hoodlum Birds. Um, my wife and I are, are, are strangely um, fascinated with uh, boxing. Um, and we, we used to watch a lot on, on uh, HBO. Um, and, um, but there's a, a, a boxer that uh, really, um, appealed to my imagination, uh, a boxer before my time. Um, some of you may have heard of him. Uh, his name was Flash Elorde, you know, a Filipino boxer. Flash Elorde. It was in the city that had no autumns where Flash Elorde landed a wacky left hook. Harold Gomez, Harold Gomez's jaw popped like a dim light bulb and he stayed down a full 70 seconds after the bell. This is a story of the old uncles from the Valley of Artichokes who threw out their backs for 15 cents an hour. Summertime, the old uncles flocked to the canneries then returned during the harvest months to cut artichokes. The fragmented syntax of their stories yellow with age like saved news clippings with a photo of a boxer raised on the shoulders of men with slick back black hair or crew cut like their idol with a lightning bolt on his trunks. For decades, I believed that Flash Elorde had retreated into Midwestern obsolescence to some armpit town with two train silos and a quarry where a misplaced old uncle could, could be seen on the square emerging from the pharmacy. He'd be soft in the middle, more like our local pharmacist, like than the aging but fit high school coach married to the church organist. 
That was the fiction we spread to forget the stories kindred with fish sauce and Del Monte canned sardines. The old uncles yellowing like wallpaper in downtown flop houses. But in 1956, they put on their suits and laid down their cutting knives, stood up from stoop labors to board a bus for San Francisco. All true stories are autumnal. In 1956, on South Van Ness, just beyond the crotch that split the mission and Dubose, Flash Elorde won six fights at the old mission gardens. The year captured in the yellowing photograph in a news clipping someone saved, showing him caught by the camera's lens in a sea of black hair, arms raised in excess like summer gold. Okay. I'm gonna read uh, two more poems. Um, this is uh, from my latest collection, um, Sightseer in This Killing City. Um, the central figure in this collection is actually a Filipino nurse. Um, uh, and um, the, the story of this nurse is uh, sort of based on a, a former neighbor of ours. Um, when we lived in San Francisco, we lived in a flat and below us was another Filipino family. And uh, the daughter was a nurse. And, um, and I've always been fascinated by her story. And one, one piece of legend about her was that um, coming home from her shift, from her uh, graveyard shift, she uh, was accosted by someone and, and she ended up stabbing that person. And I thought as a little boy, wow, she's my hero. What, what an amazing feat to be, one, to be carrying a knife and, to, and then to stab somebody. Um, so anyway, that always fascinated me. So the title of um, the, the, the poem I'll read later is Nurse Nasarima. Nasarima is American spelled backwards, by the way. But the first poem I'll read um, here is called Apron, and it's based on her mother. Apron. Unlike the grotesque bonnet worn at church, the apron is more a second cousin to the humble scarf in winter. The apron would never say, so what to you? She's agreeable as a, kin as a kitchen mantle with ripening fruit a sponge when it comes to stink, splatter of fish scales and fish guts, the errant strafe of grease from angry skillets, the teary onions grief and stutter. In middle life, the apron aspires to stand before sinners and saints and carve verses on stone. Mon coeur, mi anu, she'll tattoo on your chest. She's your last line of defense against burnt anchovies, the wide net draping over the frightful forest, the canvas cradling the boxer's face, a makeshift dressing on a playground wound. The apron is the fulsome embrace for a brother shoving off, the one with the empty pockets coming home to the damp, dark folds of her familiar stink. And the last poem I'll read is um, Nurse Nasarima from Sightseer in This Killing City. Um, thank you, Eileen, for having me. Uh, and, um, and it's a, a great, uh, great, great uh, pleasure and honor to, to meet new poets from all over the world. So good to meet uh, Romaline and, and Troy and, uh, and uh, to be reunited with my good friend, uh, Luisa, at least uh, virtually. Nurse Nasarima, not a swimmer in sapphire seas, but only someone's dad who went out for a pack of smokes to script his own undoing. Call him a linguistic ship, which doesn't need a skipper, a misplaced marine in a forest of stiletto and swagger. Welcome to a wilderness of down timber, his tree a lit wedding gown, white, green, yellow, red, then all white again. In this light, the nurse enters. Hair cut short makes her look butch. Her hemline hangs stiffly over daikon legs. A boxer with a pug nose, her provenance is Manilenia, hails from the barrio of Tondo, and packs a knife 
in her purse. She wiped her switchblade with a tissue and clicked blade back into the handle. The merchant seaman had scoped, had scoped out the skirt, so saith the knife, telling us her version. All he wanted was to feel good. All he wanted was to talk shoes. He sidled up to the nurse waiting for the bus when a knife appeared and told him to go to hell. Down he went into a kaleidoscope of broken mirrors, a festive flotilla, blood and pavement. The seaman doubles over, then falls flat on the seat of his pants on the corner of Hayton Fillmore. Failure drapes his body like an oversized shirt flowing like jibs in front of Hank's 500. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. It's always a powerful experience hearing you read. Um, uh, can you tell us more about any um, projects you're working on right now? Yeah, my, my most current project is grading papers and uh, student, pap student papers and portfolios. Uh, and then I'm looking forward to uh, my sabbatical starting in the spring. So that's about all I can think of right now that I'm looking forward to. <laughs> but thanks for asking. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you, Eugene. Um, Eugene's books are in stock at archipelagobooks.com. Our next reader is Danibel Gutierrez, a writer, actress, and photographer. Danibel's writing can be seen in Postscript Magazine, Abu Dhabi, and Illustrado Magazine, among others. A video of her poem can also be seen in Vogue Arabia, recited by the singer Sierra. Danibel is the author of the poetry books, And Until the Dreams Come, and I Long to Be the River. She was born in Las Piñas and raised in Cairo, Vienna, and Muscat, and is currently in Dubai, where she lives, loves, and writes. Thank you for staying up, Danibel. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me, Eileen. It is such an honor to be reading alongside such gifted and esteemed Filipino writers. Um, the first poem that I'll be reading is a love poem from my second book, And Until the Dreams Come. And the poem is called Soft Curves, Sharp Tongue. Habibi, Ayuni, I whisper to you in the dark and you smile. I love it when you breathe in Arabic, you say. The nights that I want to kiss you in the language my mother taught me, I stop myself, knowing how my tongue would curl on the accent and how its staccato would sharpen my teeth. Even the word soft, malambot, sounds like something that can hit you in the head and the word surrender, suko, sounds like something that I can kill you with and I love you too much. So instead, I speak to you with eyelashes, downturned mouth, small hands, weak knees turned inward. I love you in English prose and I kiss you in French songs. Last Saturday, you asked me why I whisper sweet nothings to you in every other language except for my own. I smiled and changed the subject. Did you know that when translated, the derivation of my language, Tagalog, Tagailog, means of the river? The truth is, if I speak it, I'm afraid you won't survive the waterfall you see. My tongue was handed down to me by datus and katiponeros. The truth is, my mouth is a battlefield you wouldn't know how to fight in. So, um, painting has always been this frustration of mine. I could never really get the pencil or the paint to do what I want them to do. So I thought, why not write a poem instead as if I were making a still life painting? And so this next poem is called OFW Tchotchkes. Still Life, 1990 to 2020. Envelopes with do not fold in capital letters, letters unfolded and refolded, read and reread like memorizing a poem. Pictures on the ref held by a magnet 
next to reminders and bills unpaid. Telephone cards scattered or collected, framed. Lists of habilin, reminders, oval outlines of shoe, sizes, on scrap paper, voices recorded on cassette, played and replayed like a song. Money transfer, slips shoved in jeans pockets, folded and placed in the wallet or lost in the black hole of a purse. Balik buy in boxes, of course, and stockpiling pasalubong for the next flight. Boarding passes, emails, family screenshots on video calls, life lived online, life running or put on pause until the next stop, the next destination, else just lived. All of life is transient, but it is still life. So um, I, I grew up in Cairo, Vienna, and Muscat, and <laughs> life as a third culture kid is really something. <laughs> I get asked where I am from, and I, for a time, I struggled with the answer. And I thought, OK, since I've written a still life painting poem, let's try a self-portrait, which I thought was interesting because Roma read a group portrait earlier on. Um, so this is called self-portrait in a constantly changing landscape. One, pink bathing suit and barefoot collects sigai, shells in Puerto Azul's gunmetal sand collects bottles nestled in the overgrown talahib in the vacant lot across green plaid skirt, matching tie, white blouse and pigtails, Protestant girl in a Catholic school signs the cross. Two, Sequin t-shirts and shorts collects jasmine flowers in the courtyard eats gambari sandwiches tahina peeled pink shrimp enveloped in flat bread baladi halved memorizes zayik wa ismak e wa eda wa doesn't hesitate when asked fein el bayt where is home has memorized shara metin khamsa wa sitin folds paper airplanes, lets them fly from a, a balcony in Zamalek. Three, baby doll dresses and army boots, collects Polaroids developed in the pocket of a designer fur coat fished out from the dumpster. The still unperfected Arabic mouth tastes Deutsch, learns Umlaut, learns Österreich, ist ein Ausländer, aus Philippinen, no papers, hides under blonde hair, red hair, sagging jeans, learns Sinkil. Dances in the daylight at Stephansplatz, avoids getting caught in the Kawaiian opening and closing to a beat, a rhythm, learns misdirection, says look. Look at my golden fans twirling. Four, naked, standing in front of the air conditioner, collects alienation, hesitates when asked, Saan ka saatin? Saatin? Ours? Surely yours? Mine? Question mark. Spends hours in the ocean, forgets the language of the sea, the rate of exchange, rough sand on skin, souls tar stained in Kurum, learns Tagalog in the Philippine school, Viennese accent, shoes, tries to swallow Arabic, can't digest it well enough. Five. Anything that won't cling to sticky skin in the tropical heat, collects bottles from the corner store, goes to the University of Hinebra, San Miguel, major in Bilog and Cuatro Canto, minor in Tanduay, La Pad, speaks Tagalog but doesn't fully understand, speaks Filipino but is misunderstood, collects hearts from long night stands with curious, curious boys. Six, clothed in the love of the ex-boyfriend, current boyfriend, fiance, collects letters, pictures, debt, carries, miscarries, carries this loneliness of transience like a knife, like a spoon, dull, and will scrape the bottom of an empty tub of ice cream, learns first loves can't be last loves, learns can't marry your father, learns this is not where I want to be, learns I am not who I want to be. Seven, clothed but naked, writes poetry, collects 
moments. Fridge magnets, keychains, designer bags, carries memories, cradles, transients like a child. Chuckles at conversations overheard and understood, has remembered the joy of barefoot in Jumeirah's abalone sand, has learned to say Allah and Puera Usog on the same breath to say Dankeschön. Shukran, salamat, thank you for this fragmented existence, knows not to hesitate when asked, where are you from, has learned to say, the Philippines, but. So um, I will now leave you with a poem called Uwi. I like to think about words and semantics a lot. I must be a writer. <laughs> but yeah, so I like to imagine how words came to be words. And I have a, a few poems that deal with what Tagalog words mean. And this is one of them. Uwe, verb, to go back to your residence. One word meaning to return, not just anywhere, but home. I wonder how often the ancestors had to leave, had to go, had to work, had to travel on foot, had to climb down mountains, had to walk across rice fields, had to sail across islands, across continents, for miles, for years, for this word to be invented. I was seven years old when we moved to Cairo. I remember scribbling notes to my mother saying, Let's go home. My mother sentimental kept the notes. I look at them. Now I wonder what home, which one? The rented apartment, Muscat, Dubai, Vienna, where my mother is, Inang Bayan, the country I am from but barely know. I wonder how often the ancestors had to reassure the ones who left said, it is okay. Go, explore, work, adventure, have fun. And when you're ready, when you are done, kahit gaano kalayo, kahit gaano katagal, may uuwian ka. Here is home. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to read for all of you. <laughs> Thank you, Eileen, for inviting me. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, uh, that was amazing. Danabo, you made me cry. Thank you. Um, can you tell us more about any forthcoming events? Um, so far, no events. Um, it's still kind of, you know, pan pandemia pa. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, I'm still writing my third book. I've been writing it for five years. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll finish sometime next year. <laughs> Thank you. Friends, so Danabo's books are available from bookshop.org. Our final reader really needs no introduction. Originally from Baguio, she has recently been appointed the 20th Poet Laureate of the Commonwealth of Virginia by Governor Ralph Northam. I speak of none other than Dr. Luisa A. Igloria, the author of 14 books of poetry and uh, four chapbooks and is the Distinguished Professor of Creative Writing and English at Old Dominion University. Luisa is also the recipient of various national and international literary awards. Her most recent book is Maps for Migrants and Ghosts, released uh, by Southern U Illinois University Press this year. Please welcome Luisa e. Gloria. Thank you so much, Eileen. Um, thank you, friends, for joining us from different time zones. And Eileen, I just want to say I really admire not only your strong lipstick game, but especially how in your capacity as Poet Laureate of San Mateo and reappointed to a second term. Congratulations, Eileen. You've been doing so much great work bringing poets to together for programs like this. And thank you, as everyone has said, thank you for this invitation to share reading space with Troy, Danabel, Eugene, Romaline, uh, fabulous poets all. Like Eileen said, I was born, well, I grew up in Baguio, was raised in Baguio, but I was actually born in Makati. And now I'm coming to you from Norfolk, Virginia in the US. 
And I learned on my arrival here some 22 years ago that this area has among the largest concentration of Filipinos on the southeastern seaboard. And some of this is because of the Navy and its recruitment efforts extending to the Philippines since the late 1890s. And there's also a large population of Filipinos in medical and health fields here. Uh, for instance, my doctor is Filipino American and so is my dentist. Um, and to kind of contextualize this in, in terms of other migrant workers in general, in 2019, 28.4 million foreign born or immigrant workers made up almost 18% of the entire labor force. And in Virginia alone, one in six workers is an immigrant, making up 17% of the state's labor force in 2018 alone. So we're immigrant workers are in numerous fields and industries. Um, they're professionals, they are in uh, science and technology, in healthcare, in construction, in food services, so all over. And uh, I just also wanted to say that immigrant workers are often maligned as lazy, or weak-minded or slow. And in general, uh, they're, but even if they're described by the US um, Census Bureau as actually having the high, highest participation in the labor force than American born workers. So I, I appreciate your pulling together this program to honor our own uh, migrant Filipino workers all over the world, uh, not just where we are. Um, and Filipino-American labor organizer, poet, and writer Carlos Bulosan, of course, was one of the earliest in our communities who wrote about the importance of continuing to chronicle migrant and immigrant lives through our stories, our art, and other forms of witness. So thank you all for doing that in your own work. I'm, I'm just blown away. The first poem uh, I'd like to read is um, not yet published in any book. It's part of my daily writing practice. I found myself writing a lot of epistolary poems addressed to America, letter poems, um, Dear America poems. I'm not sure where these things are going, but I think it's a, um, a side effect of living through uh, the, the stresses of our time and feeling how these affect our communities in particular. So here's my first poem, America. America, you were the cousin who joined a beauty contest the year before her visa application cleared so she could be a nurse somewhere in Rochester, New Jersey. She didn't think a roll of sheepskin inked with her name and St. Louis University would be enough. Soon after, she sent pictures of the doctor she would marry. In America, we like to think there might have been love and not just a green card. We hear they're still together in their dotage. America, you were another cousin slowly dying from cancer, alone in an apartment in Maryland. I knew her only by name and the photographs she sent her stylish bob, her cigarettes, her drugstore bought dark glasses, the patent leather Mary Janes she sent one Christmas, the walking doll with flaxen hair, white lace bib and pinafore, the vacant eyes that opened and closed and give me nightmares even now. And you were a certain smell before we even began to understand what you really were, synthetic and abnormally clean, like Clorox or Windex, with a bottom note of soda left open in the sun. It wafted up from a box that took two months to ship from your flank or your hip or armpit, wherever it was people like us found neighborhoods where they could rent walk-ups whose stairwells overflowed with steam from rice pots. America, we can shine and scrub your floors without a Hoover or a Roomba, then punch holes in the bottoms of fruit cocktail cans so we can grow bird chilies and tomatoes on the veranda. We let a dentist in our old hometown pull all our teeth so you wouldn't get the chance to do it 
and charge us triple. There is a fish we like to eat whose belly is soft and sweet and full of fat, but every bone in its body is a tree that bristles with more than a dozen spears. Like you, America, if we're not careful, we could choke on even the smallest mouthful. And my thank you. My second poem um, is also not published currently. This poem is an overseas contract worker. This poem arrived alone, close to midnight, with no traveling companions, with two pieces of luggage that rolled across the cobblestones, looking for the address it was given. This poem sat uneasy in the back of the yellow cab, looking out at unfamiliar landmarks wrapped in fog as the driver remarked offhand, you're a brave one to be by yourself at this hour. This poem slept on a couch in someone's living room for three weeks until they found others like her to room with, until the first check from the hiring agency came, less agency deductibles and expenses. This poem shyly accepted the invitation to a church function. Wives and sisters piled her plate with food, taking her home after. One of the husbands touched her breasts and laughed. This poem stole an hour before her workday began at dawn to write letters to her children back home. But never did she let on how many hours she worked, how meager the meals compared to the blows. Um, I'll read, my, my next poem is from my new book, Maps for Migrants and Ghosts. And shortly I'll put a link in the chat so you can find your way to it. Hopefully show my book some love. Um, I just want to say before reading this that people leave home or their home country, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, for a lot of different reasons. I left for the US initially to go to graduate school, leaving behind my three older daughters in the care of family when they were very young. And I remember being told by so called well meaning friends that there would be dire consequences for such a choice as the one that I had made. But uh, I think like one of you said, I think it was Danabelle, sometimes we forget that it's okay to dream no matter what our um, origins or circumstances. So this is a poem called, We Don't Live in the Light. And it's one of those poems that has a drop down title, title first line. We don't live in the light only to forget everything. Neither do we lie in the dark just to barter these days of bee hum and wheatgrass for a mouthful of seeds. When the days are long like this, the heart casts a longer shadow. The future swings like a bell or flaps like a shirt or shroud drying to a certain shape on the line. I count out the hard clicking of abacus beads to clear more space, but the hours hurtle toward their edge. Am I supposed to become that woman then, crazed by the blinding silence of snow, seduced by the river's mystery under ice? When I keen into the wind, door hinges rattle as if possessed. I won't quiet them. Once I was the body that housed other bodies. I was expected only to give, not to take. Um, okay, I'll read two more poems with your permission. Um, I think that there's a lot of nostalgia 
in the poetry of uh, immigrant writers. And this is also a function of their having left someplace and feeling perhaps that they can never uh, claim that place left behind anymore. They also feel like they're continually uh, in that lim liminal space of the in-between. And I think the nostalgia that immigrants feel comes from the sensation, in the words of another poet, Naomi Shihem Nye, that they have a heart in at least two countries. So I would like to read poem across time zones. Forgive me, for I am only one in a field of more than the unstoppable uproar of amaranth and bindweed, of more than a hundred bursting nettles. What could I do to hoist up my voice as it climbs the ivy grows more stalwart each year? where it clings to the fence and the building's red brick, a shadow cultivates its own defense or defiance. Believe me when I say what I wished most was not to be found wanting. Believe me when I say I haven't stopped hoping we'll hold up our faces in the same downpour. And for my final poem, I'd like to read a praise poem. It's also not yet published in any book. I hope to find a home for it in a new manuscript I'm also working on. It's called Magnificat. And you know, that is the, the sort of praise prayer also. Magnificat. Let us praise, they said, and so we should. Let us praise the wood that was saved from the house and the stones we used for the new kitchen floor. Let us praise the walls which leaked with the fury of hurricanes, yet kept us dry where we huddled in the middle of the room. Let us praise the wildness of the garden which gave us mint to fragrance our hands and branches from which to hang wet clothes. Let us praise the nights that were strung with curfews and the hiding places we found in them for fugitives and friends. Let us praise the ones who left, even of their own volition, and the hearts that must have suffered from the myriad difficulties of choice. Let us praise how we witnessed a rash of flowers open one by one along the broken fence, even as the sea or heaving earth took those we loved. And let us praise the clapper and the hollow gong, both pain and joy have made of our insides, how forever we will swing this way in the wind. Thank you. That was stunning. Thank you, Louisa. Um, can you tell us more about any events or, or what your plans are for the holidays? Uh, like Eugene, I am stuck in the island of grading. <laughs> uh, and uh, after that, I, there are a couple of readings I'm participating in with some um, colleagues who are members of the Poetry Society of Virginia. I've been posting these on my Facebook page and my social media. There is a solstice reading, which is taking place on the 21st. That's the uh, closest one. So you all just check it out on social media and I would love it if you could join us there too. Thank you again, Louisa. Um, Louisa's book, Maps for Migrants and Ghosts is um, a lovely and necessary work and currently available at philippinebookshop.com and other retailers. Friends, this concludes our virtual event today in celebration of the month of Overseas Filipinos and International Migrants Day. I wish to thank Consul General Henry Bensurto of the Consulate General of the Philippines in San Francisco for his support. And um, please join me in thanking um, our featured poets and culture bearers, Romalin Ante, Troy Cabida, Eugene Gloria, Danabel Gutierrez, and Luisa A. Gloria. What connects us beyond blood and tradition are our hopes and dreams for self, family, and community. Please stay safe and stay healthy wherever you are. 
maligayang Pasko at masagana, mapayapa at manigong bagong taon sa ating lahat. Um, Thank think, you, Eileen. Uh, please, Thank uh, you. Can, you, can you unmute and just say bye and happy holidays to everybody. Um, Thank you, Deputy Congen Solano, for staying. Um, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Bye. 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 Thank you.